Well, hello. Welcome. It's the golden path to spring one. And I'm here with my good friend, Ram. How are you doing today? I know that we just had a little power hiccup, but it looks like you're back. I'm glad that we actually get to see you. Other than that, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for asking, Deshaun. This is wonderful. Uh, you and I, we've gotten to connect and work together a few times over the years around mm -hmm. Cloud Foundry and the, and the ecosystem, and, and you've been keeping busy. There's a lot of new stuff happening, and I'm excited to dig in. Very excited. Mm -hmm. Me too. So for our audience, would you mind introducing yourself? Tell us. Sure. Um, so like Rishan uh, said, my name is Ram. I am uh, Chief Evangelist with the Cloud Foundry Foundation. What that means is I get to carry this message of Cloud Foundry goodness all around the world, uh, get to interact with uh, and manage our wonderful community of uh, engineers who are uh, contributing so much to uh, open source Cloud Foundry. I have the opportunity um, to also showcase a lot of the projects that the community is working on and basically steal all the applause for myself. <laughs> for a lot of work that there's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Somebody has to do it. <laughs> so I tell my kids, my kids call me the hype man. I'm a hype man for spring and for Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of what this role is. You're a hype man for all the good things that the community is doing. And right. I'm here for it. Well, technical difficulties aside, do you feel like you're ready to get started? Mm, yeah, uh, let's uh, let's start. All right. I'm going to bring it up uh, for everybody that's watching. Ask your questions in the chat. And if we've got a good spot, I'll interject those questions. But otherwise, we'll address the questions at the end. All right. Excellent. I'll scoot, I'll scoot off and I'll let you go. You got it. Thanks, Dishan. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about Kubernetes, a little bit about Cloud Foundry, and a lot about Spring, obviously. Um, so what I have planned for today is to go through this new project known as Cloud Foundry Query Fee and showcase some of its capabilities, um, show what it can, um, and you know, more importantly, cannot do. And um, what we are going to go through um, eventually is to see what is possible with Query Fee and Spring in general. And I want to showcase how we are solving certain difficulties around the general Kubernetes experience with uh, some of Cloud Foundry technologies. Um, the first step that I'm going to take is to bring up a terminal and kick off an installation, all right? So I have a query fee here. Um, so for those who are uh, even marginally unfamiliar uh, with the Cloud Foundry ecosystem. So uh, Cloud Foundry is entirely open source. So you can find a lot of our, pro you can find all of our projects on uh, GitHub. We have a rather big ecosystem, uh, a lot of whom consume the open source tools directly. And some of our um, users go through our vendors um, such as VMware and Tanzu. Um, and some of our other vendors also include SAP and IBM. And Cloud Foundry generally powers a lot of the PaaS and the cloud platforms that um, some of these major companies happen to um, productize and um, make available. Um, today, we're going to, uh, like I mentioned, uh, take a look at uh, this project called Query Fee. And Corifi is um, an open source abstraction that we are trying to make available over Kubernetes. Um, there's some history and background about this. I'll get into it um, 
in just a bit. But before we can do that, what I'm going to do right now is I have a kind cluster onto which I'm going to install query fee. And uh, I'm going to make use of a simple script um, that comes. So OK, so it's going to deploy a cluster called Spring One Demo onto Kind, and it's going to install Query Fee on top of that. So while this runs in the background, um, literally and figuratively, um, let's quickly talk about um, Query Fee. So a lot of us, uh, you know, probably agree when we say that um, the developer experience around Kubernetes can be a little complex. There's uh, you know, a lot going on. And more than me trying to um, say this originally, I think we can go back to like a couple of talks that happened. Um, one of my favorites was by Thomas Vitale. And I think a week or two, a little over a week ago, I think um, um, he, he stated the problem much more clearly and succinctly than I ever can. So with platforms, um, he specifies these three goals, right? So there should be a rapid and continuous feedback loop uh, with very low overheads for developers and that they should have a clean and safe paved path to production. And so Cloud Foundry has historically been in the in the business, I don't want to use the word business, but in the business of um, enabling software engineering teams that are small, that are big, that are enterprise grade, that are smaller, that are governments, that are banks, that are financial institutions, what have you, right? Cloud Foundry has been in the business of enabling exactly these three abilities for a lot of teams. And so what we've come to realize over the years is today, the infrastructure that you might use is, let's say, virtual machines. And tomorrow it might be Kubernetes. And you know soon it might be something totally different from both of these. But these essential characteristics are going to remain the same for Cloud Foundry. And so today we present what is known as Query Fee. And Query Fee is designed with the aim of enabling exactly those outcomes, but for Kubernetes-based infrastructure. Now, in the same series that you're watching right now, um, you probably had a preview in uh, Nick Kuhn's talk, which was actually the first of the talks to kick off in this series. And so he gave folks a short preview of uh, what Query Fee is. And he also mentioned that it's available within Tanzu as the Tanzu application adapter, if I, if I remember correctly, Tanzu application service adapter or something like that. So it's uh, already a part of a um, very viable commercial stack if, uh, if folks are interested in going that route in order to consume Cloud Foundry. But for the scope of this talk, I'm going to sort of limit myself to discussing um, Curry Fee. So I think that's a, that's good timing. It just completed uh, installing uh, locally. So we can uh, quickly verify this by checking out um, what is happening with K9s. So K9s, if you're not familiar, is a great um, way to uh, take a look at what's happening inside Kubernetes clusters. It's I, I highly recommend using that alongside uh, Query Feed just to sort of see uh, what's going on. So as you can see in the default namespace, there's like a bunch of different pods and other things that are that have been created and are running. So we'll take a look at um, what these internals are, how they work together um, and all that in just a bit. Let's jump back to my um, slides and um, 
and see what we are uh, in for today. So the Cloud Foundry experience um, in and by itself can be summarized as a source code to URL kind of experience. It uh, basically lets developers take source code that they have. So when you're in the application source, you can use a single command to actually deploy that application onto your infrastructure. Now, Traditionally, or 10 years ago, this infrastructure was virtual machines. And if you imagine what all the problems uh, were that the community was facing then was, um, how do I manage my VMs better in terms of keeping them um, you know, used at the right amount? How do I make sure that uh, I'm not blowing too much cash into just creating a lot of VMs and not using them. How do I make sure that I'm um, cleaning up resources after I use them? How do we make sure that uh, my VM compute is actually being used efficiently and things like that? And so Cloud Foundry began its life as a VM orchestrator of sorts. Now, fast forward 10 years, the problems somehow continue to remain the same, except that the whole world has now shifted to containers and today the problems uh, seem to be how do i you know keep my increasing number of containers in check how do i make sure that you know my containers are being utilized most efficiently with the compute resources that i have and so what we see is that there is a paradigm shift in terms of the kind of infrastructure that's in play and some of the infrastructure abstractions that have come into the picture. But essentially, the nature of the problems that the community is trying to solve remain largely the same. And so this contract of taking source code, publishing that as, or pushing that, or deploying that as an immutable artifact onto infrastructure of an engineering team's choice or an organization's choice, and returning that with a URL that you can basically make use of in order to access the application or the API or the service, what have you, is something that the community seems to find very valuable. And um, this experience is not just about doing this for a particular kind of compute, but also relevant to any kind of infrastructure that's coming into play. Um, you know, as time goes by. So this kind of reminds a lot of folks when I speak to them about two things. A, um, it reminds them of Heroku back in the day, the kind of single command Heroku, push, git, master. Uh, and then you have a URL that actually hosts your application and you can, you know, start toying with that. And the other thing that um, more recently, um, it reminds folks of some stuff having to do with the Knative community. And so there's definitely some overlap historically and technologically between um, Heroku and what we're trying to achieve here and Knative and uh, where we're going with this project. And so Hero uh, the, the best sort of pitch that I've been able to give folks for Cloud Foundry is it's Heroku, but on your own infrastructure. And now I'm just changing or tweaking that slightly. And I'm saying it's Heroku, but on a Kubernetes cluster of your choice. And that seems to interest like a, a, a lot of people, right? So Heroku and Cloud Foundry interestingly have a lot of underpinnings uh, that they share. Um, they both uh, emerged, you know, at the turn of the last decade. So like about 10 years ago, uh, Cloud Foundry was able to enable the same kind of developer experience as Heroku did, but on infrastructure of people's choice. And today it's able to enable that you know, same experience on a Kubernetes cluster of people's choice. So if you have a managed Kubernetes provider, um, you're able to install Corifi on top of that, and you're essentially able to gain that Cloud Foundry experience. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the ability to run on Kubernetes, the 
notion of taking your source and getting back with a url or an endpoint in order to consume that app or that service it's sort of you know similar to the notion of a build workload and a run workload um, which are all similar to some of the key native anatomy that we've seen um, from from that particular uh, technology right so what is sort of um, the value that cloud foundry typically adds is a question that we get you know asked often and in this case it's basically this cloud infrastructure and then you need a whole bunch of different things to be functional around this cloud infrastructure in order for the infrastructure to actually be of some use right compute by itself is you know close to meaningless and um, as you start to build on top of uh, these vms and 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 deliver more in terms of the application itself you start to see more value uh, coming out of it and so kubernetes is is no different so by itself kubernetes when it started and even today to some extent um provided value a lot of value in terms of orchestrating a bunch of containers that you deploy onto its runtime but in order for kubernetes to actually be functional you needed to build like a lot more around it and you need to spend a lot of time you need to spend a lot of effort in order to make kubernetes be more pragmatic and useful for you right and that's the problem that corifi is setting out to solve you know little by little and as of today every company and every sort of engineering team and every organization has a very specific and opinionated method in which they would like to solve like each of these things there's there's different ways they want to do identity there's different ways in which they wanted to do services there's very different notions that they have about how networking should be configured they're very specific ways in which they want to do logging and multi tenancy and all of these things around kubernetes and that's where the entire sort of cncf landscape has emerged now i have nothing against watching such a massive burst of innovation in the community and in the technology space in general but this can be a little overwhelming for a lot of teams to consume and so combining this great developer experience and combining this overwhelming set of options that engineers have in front of them in order to realize functional kubernetes it's important to understand that a rather opinionated and structured approach into how you want to create this developer experience around your kubernetes cluster becomes rather important so um, there's also notions of platform engineering that overlap into this discussion and you know rightly so it's it's with the idea of creating this platform and providing that as a service to the engineering team is what defines query fi and is it's what has been defining cloud foundry for a while now and it's what defines query fi also so if you look at this particular diagram that i have on screen it sort of shows clearly what parts are you know coupled together and what parts query fi actually abstracts for a user and what portions of you know the 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 whole sort of as and the 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 application stack basically makes sense for teams to tinker with and um, you know also do not make sense at all for teams to tinker with and should really be left alone so the way 
Corifi has been designed and the way the Cloud Foundry community sees this working is um, if you start at this column here on the left, this entire column is sort of responsible for you know keeping an application running and there's like a whole bunch of different things uh, that, that go all the way down. Now each of these have been optimized and worked on and researched and improved and innovated on over the years. And um, some of these have seen standardization. And what we see um, right now is, you know, in, the, in the, the, the stack in the middle where there's a lot better standardization closer to the bottom. And uh, people are very clear about what they want and what they don't. And then there's you know a bunch of stuff that can be configured depending on the opinions and depending on the preferences and depending on the needs of every application that's running on them and every team that's designing an application. And so I just wanted to go back to the slide and highlight. And that's where this notion of having like so many different projects um, has originated because each of these projects in, um, are meant to realize the same set of ends, but in slightly different ways. Um, for an application to run on Kubernetes, you could have several ways of configuring networking. You could have several ways of configuring services. You could have several ways of configuring authorization. You could have several different services themselves um, playing in like there's there's so many container runtimes to choose from there's so many container registries to choose from right and choosing one over the other is not necessarily a wrong choice or a bad choice it's just that it is defined by the opinion of certain people on the team and it is provided as a platform for the team to work on and work with and so that's the notion that we are carrying forward and We've chosen a sane set of defaults for routing and RBAC and logs and helping create multi-tenancy and things like that. And we're making that available as Cloud Foundry Query Fee. Cloud Foundry Query Fee, again, is being tested on Kubernetes um, deployments on various uh, cloud providers. Um, so we have daily tests running uh, to make sure it functions on EKS and Azure Kubernetes and uh, the VMware Tanzu uh, Kubernetes service. And so we're, we're constantly adding more and more services to that. And uh, we're increasing the breadth and the coverage that we're able to provide. It, uh, it could be lacking in a few areas, but it's an ongoing effort. Um, we obviously don't have like 100% coverage of all the, I don't know, 50, 55 odd Kubernetes providers at the moment, but we're getting there, uh, although slowly, <laughs> we're getting there. So at a very high level um, and abstracting a lot of the different pieces that are actually present, um, the query fee architecture sorts of boils down into these major blocks. Um, we'll go into a little more detail as we look uh, at deploying an app or maybe what we can do is kick off a deployment and we can continue to examine um, what this does so let's see um, again it's only uh, becoming of me if I uh, deploy a spring app uh, but before I make the actual deployment itself I need to uh, log in and I'll I'll be using my um, local kind cluster. So the API endpoint that it's configured to work with is localhost. And uh, for purposes of this demo, I'm going to skip this um, SSL validation. Um, you could create this um, with the right kind of certificates and keys, etc. cetera. Um, but that's a discussion for uh, later. So as you can see, um, Corifi RBAC has been 
connected uh, with like the default kubernetes are back and so query fee authentication will happen to the cluster using a role called a cf admin but it is essentially a default um set of our back and it can also connect to like kubernetes service accounts as of the latest release that happened last week so i'm going to uh, next create what is known as an org and a space so an org is essentially a a means to configure tenants inside your kubernetes system now you can um look at how um crds will keep getting added as we um add an auth and a space and things like that so the way cloud foundry works is you can have an org and an org can have many spaces and you can have multiple orgs with on the same cf foundation a foundation is an installation of uh, cloud foundry and so this i can create another org and so um you know you can you can have many spaces within the org and so imagine those as you know departments and applications or uh, if you're an agency each of these orgs can be different clients and each of the spaces within them can be applications for each client and so there's different uh, cf roles um, or users that have the ability to manage these orgs and things like that so i'm going to use one of the orgs that i created and so the next thing that you have to do is create a space okay four dash s test so right now i am i'm being what cloud foundry has done is created the space and uh, created the space and assigned a role of space manager and space developer and things like that to um to me the the logged in user a cf admin so um let's go back and if you check this um one second so this is uh, this is unlike namespaces or clusters or uh, any of the other kubernetes primitives that you're familiar with no uh, uh, a slight uh, detour one of the things that we toyed with was trying to use hierarchical namespaces along with um uh, query fee um and and making use of different um, namespaces nested within each other in order to realize this but we soon ran into certain limitations and the cloud foundry model that was built using crds seemed like a much more viable tool than what we tried to realize with hierarchical namespaces itself and so unlike kubernetes clusters and unlike kubernetes namespaces and unlike kubernetes pods and um unlike any of these kubernetes primitives that create a sort of separation um orgs and spaces exist in cloud in the cloud foundry layer of the abstraction but they wouldn't when you talk about um the kubernetes native system itself and so what does that look like we'll take a look at that as soon as um, you know we we deploy an app so right now um we have a local kind cluster that's you know running lo you know a kind cluster that's running locally i am the cf admin user and i'm going to make use of a specific org and space inside the cf abstraction itself in order to deploy the app now so 
let's see i have a spring music app and i'm going to push that oh i'm missing something yeah okay so the cf push command itself is cf push it takes a path to the app and then it needs an app name now while this is running you can see here that there's now a build process that's kicked off all right and so this pod is actually responsible for building this application now let's quickly switch to this architecture here while the build and the push and all of that fun stuff is happening and so what i have done is using the cli pushed uh, a manifest file at the beginning so if you check here this is a manifest file that basically tells the corefi controllers that there's an application with you know so and so uh, name etc whose image that you need uh, whose oci image that you generate needs to be pushed to like a local docker registry and then this is a java application and it's going to make use of these build packs um so to be more specific it's a spring application right and um, the way Kurifi did this is not because I specified Spring in the name of the app or the path or whatever. Kurifi is capable of detecting the uh, language or framework that the app has been written in thanks to a technology known as build packs. And so um, it's a it's a slightly tangential discussion. I'll go into some detail about that uh, in just a bit. But for now, um, please know that it's these build packs that basically make it possible for people to take up any source written in any sort of language that they have throw it at a cloud foundry uh, controller and cloud foundry is able to detect what the language is what versions you have what dependencies you need and create uh, the application so the way it gets created is there's a um, gradle build process that gets kicked on um, and that's one of the layers of the build pack and then as you go, um, as the process continues, what happens is, um, I mean, you you basically see the same thing inside the pod as outside. So um, what happens here is, um, thanks to these build packs, it's a build pack is like a bunch of scripts that have very distinct stages. So there's a detect phase, uh, which is kicked off by a detect script inside the build pack. And then there's an analyze, and then there's the actual build phase, and then there's an export phase where an OCI compatible container comes out of the build process. Now what happens here is this controller kicks that off and deploys that to the container registry from where it is taken by a, a run workload flow. So that basically puts that onto the Kubernetes uh, container runtime itself. And then it configures load balancing and networking around this container. And it generates a URL that is made available. So in this case, this is the URL um, that we have that I'm going to just open here. right so yeah that's that's basically you know everything okay so we now have like an app that has been created and that's running here and 
yeah it basically you know created that spring app and deployed it to a kubernetes cluster right so the if if folks have any questions about what they've seen so far i encourage you to drop them into the comments um and uh, wonderful i've got questions i've got a whole list of questions so a couple of questions that came in one was are orgs similar to kubernetes clusters i think you addressed that it's like the mm -hmm. the org is a different construct but i'm going to give you another shot that was one of the questions are orgs similar to kubernetes clusters explain yeah so like i mentioned uh, and as you can see uh, on the screen right now um, this k9 is basically listing all of the pods in the names uh, in this namespace now this particular pod that we are on actually corresponds to the pod that is the application uh, itself this has nothing to do with um, kubernetes clusters or kubernetes namespaces or a kubernetes pod or what have you so this is a cloud foundry construct that is superimposed as a pod on kubernetes so when you look at this from the um, perspective of cloud foundry there is an app and this app is functional and running in an org called foo in a space called test by the user cf admin none of this has anything to do with kubernetes and what this entire thing maps into is a single pod that's actually running the app um, conversely there's no kubernetes construct that's native uh, such as kubernetes clusters that map into that map one on one into like a cloud foundry um entity um so it's a it's a very clear abstraction between um pods and namespaces and clusters what have you versus orgs and spaces and all of these things excellent so you just had your app up can i scale this app as easy as i do on kubernetes yeah um so you can set in you can set this in the manifest even at the start but you can also um use like basic cloud foundry commands that you can use to um scale the number of instances so here when we push this you can see that the number of instances um for each of these apps is um one so this and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say cf scale spring music dash i i'm going to see that go up so it's as simple as that and now if you go back and look here you have another instance of the app that's getting built and then now you'll have two pods um which are basically you know the same um spring music app right um i think i have to show this at least once during a <laughs> demo <laughs> so um it's well, the only problem with that is the version it's a little bit outdated <laughs> spring version we're going to have to get that fixed sure. somewhere uh i have another question cuz the yes. only thing that you installed on your local kind the only thing that you installed at the very beginning was Kareefy. But mm -hmm. Kareefy included all of this other stuff because like when I'm setting up my local cluster, uh, even I use I like to use Knative, like there's a lot more things that I need to install. And what the thing that jumps out at me is that you just did one install and you got all the things. You got an opinionated set of these things. Am I right. correct? Is that what I saw? Yeah. So um I should probably have shown um folks this there's a there are a few prerequisites um, that you need to do as part of the install process um and that's linked off of the kurifi installation guide but it basically has like four or five different components so 
Now, because we were using kind, uh, we are using kind clusters. There's obviously kind that you require. Um, kubectl or kubectl, the debate still out there. It's raging. <laughs> is is uh, however you want to call it. Um, you need that in order to manage um, um, you know, certain things by the script that does the installation itself in order and also to set the right context when you're installing query fee on let's say some other um, some other cluster other than kind you also have to get help um, so after our first sort of two or three um, v0.2 v0.3 releases uh, we switch to using help charts for the install process itself and so um, it's been very convenient uh, to make use of helm to do the query fee installation itself and so helm is also a prerequisite tool there's also the cfcli that you have to install um, and uh, the cfcli is basically you know what gives you the cf commands and things like that and Curryfee requires that as part of the installation process itself and also later in order for it to be able to uh, function and for us to be able to interact with the Curryfee API. I remember having to install a few Carvel tools like uh, KBLD and YTT, um, but I'm not 100% sure if we still need those as prerequisites. So um, I'll double check and I'll update the documentation here uh, that you see if uh, we do require that. But uh, these are, you know, the, the prerequisites really. Wonderful. Um, you mentioned earlier about Knative and some of the overlaps between like Heroku and Knative and how that plays into Cloud Foundry. Can you touch on that again? Like, what are the overlaps? What are the similarities? Mm. I'll push, yeah, I'll push a little forward in my slides. Um, and this is a slightly deeper dive into the architecture. Hopefully, people are able to see this clearly. But if not, you know, no problem. Um, if you look at the way this functions, so you have the CLI. And the CLI basically triggers every single workflow, right? So let's, uh, assuming I do a CF push, the first thing that happens is what is known as the build workload here. So this build workload makes use of what is known as KPAC, another fantastic open source project, um, largely, I think, heralded by <laughs> uh, the VMware uh, folks. So KPAC internally takes all of this information takes the source itself basically and converts that into a container image that gets to, that that gets saved to a container registry so after that there's a second phase where the app workload here takes this image that was just built and then puts it on a stateful set and makes that available as the running app. Now, the use of these two sort of build workflow and run workflow is very similar to what Knative also makes use of, like the build service and the run service. Wonderful, wonderful. Couple more questions. Oh, you know, you knew this one was coming. What about ARM support? <laughs> is that on the roadmap? Of course. Arm support. Yes. So fortunately for Kurifi, all of that will be taken care of when the build packs and K pack will support running ARM workloads. So there's nothing additional that um Kurifi, the Kurifi community needs to do because we're just consuming these as an upstream dependency. And so um, once the Paketo build packs has ARM infrastructure or support for ARM infrastructure in place. And KPAC also supports the build uh, process. Um, both of these will naturally um, you know, create that uh, create that avenue where Kurifi will have um, ARM support enabled. Another question. 
this one's kind of near and dear and it's kind of similar or in the same vein for me is uh can we scale to zero can i have apps if they're not active can i have them scale to zero is there a minimum that i can scale down to i think the minimum is uh is one um okay if if the app is so either the app is running or it's not um you would have to create a scenario where you actually stop uh, the app i guess we could try so yeah you could in theory have like zero instances of the app um if you wanted to all right and yeah happy happy bill packs those are my questions right the cf push experience is uh really hard to reproduce uh it's amazing and a lot of the things that we were seeing right just from the the start of your session being able to have that cf push experience on my laptop oh that's that's so nice. <laughs> like just like it because it, it took a long time we wanted it we loved it you know it's, yes. it's got yes. all of the history there uh but the problem was yes. to me running on a laptop was was always yeah. cool. <laughs> and and once you did it then it, you just kind of let it let it be it, it, everything works right now but now uh, we can run kind on our laptop we can deploy yeah creepy yeah. on our laptop and we can have that same experience and man we've come a long way and i appreciate we you certainly and we have i mean <laughs> it's uh it's been such a big uh thing like an albatross around the community's neck in terms of not being able to provide a great local developer experience all these years and we're not the only ones um i think the open shift community uh played with the idea of mini shift um and then i think the cloud foundry folks had their own bosch light um uh, you know but but you know they were all rather poor attempts at uh, trying to fit yeah. like up something <clears throat> so big to, um in onto a laptop so but this has been a real shift in terms of the paradigm itself and this also opens up avenues for things like can we now put corifi on the edge so can i have edge infrastructure to which i can deploy apps to using corifi right and so i think that you know ties into one of the other questions that you asked before in terms of arm workloads and support for mm -hmm. those and so once that happens i am trying to uh, get a demo of this running on like k3s and um, if that happens i think you know that that's yet another great wonderful lightweight kubernetes distribution that the community loves and if that happens i think we are sort of heading in that direction and if the arm workload things fall into place i think you know we can say definitively that um this stuff can work um no matter where excellent so Paketo is not support upstream. This whole like running workloads uh, on the edge. I mean, the ARM support for Paketo is not there yet. I'm working on it. Uh, but running workloads on the edge is super exciting. This is something that I think you and I could probably pair together on as getting uh, some examples. Let's see where the edges are. Let's see where the sharp edges are and what works today. Uh, and then we can kind of help maybe identify some of the things from the roadmap. Yeah, absolutely. This is awesome. I'm. I'm just happy. This is great. Your demo is great. And it brings me joy because again, I've, I've sat with so many engineers where the CF push experience, I remember my first CF push experience <laughs> uh, and just the idea of what it can provide. You took a lot of the things, even if you're Kubernetes native today, you took a lot of the things and you made it super easy so that I can, I can stand up and I can have a real developer experience on a tiny bit of infrastructure. But it's it's real. It's covering all the bases, uh, the build, yeah. the run, and the manage, and that's exciting. So we had a lot of folks coming in, saying hi from all over the world. I know it's late for you, so I want to say thank you <laughs> so much. Uh, if there's any more questions, I'll do one more ask for questions. But other than that, again, thanks so much for staying up for us. We really appreciate oh, sure. the wonderful session, uh, and I look forward to working with you again soon. Thanks, Dishan. Thank you for having me. Um, my best wishes for uh, the whole Spring One um, event and um, VMware Explore and all of these. Hopefully, I can uh, come say hi in Meet Space. But um, you know, 
we have the community space to um, collaborate until then. So, yeah. Yes, indeed. Well, I don't see any more, excuse me, I don't see any more questions. So you brought okay. it up. Let me bring a couple of things up here. Uh, we have the Spring Academy. That is an awesome resource for all things spring related. You should definitely check it out. New stuff is getting added all the time. Absolutely want to check it out. We also brought up VMware Explorer, which is going to be running right alongside of Spring One. You can still mm -hmm. tune in your CFPs. The CFP, uh, the the call got extended to the 14th, I believe. So we got still a few more days to get that in. So we're looking forward to that. And other than that, thanks everybody so much for joining. We will see you again soon.